Okay, board members will get started. Um, our next item is our general consent calendar. Um, this is the time if you want to pull items um, off the off, we'll do it now and we'll discuss them. <laughs> Vice Chair Belknap. Yeah, I, everyone's read. Oh, hang. Oh, board member Klein. Member Klein. For me. Um, yes, I'd like to pull numbers one, three, and five. Okay. Um, Vice Chair Belknap. I don't see any others, so I'd like to make a motion that we approve the consent calendar minus one, three, and five. Do I have a second? Is something, did you need something, was your board member Norton, did you need? No, 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 I was just in second, but. Oh, we okay. Got it, so we're good. Moving on. Discussion to the motion? Seeing none. All those in favor say aye. Aye. Those opposed? And I'm not sure if we have right Molly. Are you an I? I am an I. All right. Thank you. Okay. Motion passage in, unanimously. Um, Member Klein. So I'm. I'm. We'll take one at a time here. Okay. So this is number one is an actionable item on. Contract. Is there a particular? Uh, so item yes, the West Ed contracts. Um, there's that, two of them. There's two of them. Yep. So uh, both of those um, on the first one. Uh, I think it's. It it ends with three nine CT for a contract number. Is that the one you wanted to speak to first? Uh, yeah, the one that's first on the list. Yes, and then the second one was a, ended with a 60 C. So to first one, Yeah. did you want to speak to it or you wanted to ask questions? Um, no, I just, I, I have issues with, with West Ed in particular. Um, and on the contract, page 10 specifically, um, there's a statement that says equity and cultural development are the ha are the hallmark of our work at Wested. Um, and if you research on their website, it becomes very apparent what they mean by equity, um, ab about uh, diversity and equity, um, inclusion, um, elevating. Um, it's the racial equity component that they. It, have in there is through a CRT lens. Um, so I have issues with that. Um, and like the fourth domain being uh, that they talk about in the contract um, being a culture shift, which entails shifting of beliefs and practices towards, and it says high ac academic expectations, um, focused on student learning development, developing shared responsibility through soliciting and acting upon stakeholder input and engaging students and families in the overall improvement effort. That's how they, that's how they um, sell it in, in the contract, but when you go to their website, um, it's, it's a whole lot more than that. It's more about ad shifting attitudes, values, and beliefs um, to, uh, to that uh, critical race theory lens. So um, I can't vote. Uh, on, like I mentioned last month, anything from Wested, I will be voting no on. Okay, this is on a contract amendment. We have Zach here. Will you, do you want to speak to the concern or a little bit of background uh, on the uh, amendment? I did want to point out, I think there might have been an error in the posting. Uh, these are on the review calendar, not on the approval calendar. Uh, so these have already been uh, executed under the authority that uh, we have under the board. So there's only one item under the approval or action uh, calendar for this month, and that is the, okay, the EBSCO so wait, contract. Hang on. Um, um, Deputy Superintendent Scott Jones, will you grab a seat? 
so there. So hang on one sec. Okay. One sec. There, there's an error of some kind here. We're going to yeah. work it out right now. So this Chair Huntsman. Contract, uh, is that included in our packet? Right. So Deputy Superintendent of Operations, Scott Jones. So these are flipped. The backups are flipped. Okay. The board is only has to approve the one contract that shows up in the review item. That's the EBSCO contract. The rest of these that show for approval are all review. So because of the bylaws, and your bylaws are $100,000 or more. So just a point of order or administrative housekeeping thing. That's what Zach was trying to explain. So, so. Okay, so this. So you can still pull them, right? I mean, it's not that, well, but we just want to make sure you're clear that. So both of them are pulled. And that's what that, that you're saying you don't want to yeah. vote, but they're not right. supposed to even be in our packet, correct? So 39 CT and the contract amendment ending 39 CT and the other one that's ending 60 CT correct would the, not be in any motion correct those are on the the review uh, uh, under the delegations of the board it's on offered. the information because the amount is under a hundred thousand dollars under a hundred thousand dollars so can I clarify yes so on um, four point two should have the information that's in 4.1 and 4.1 should have the information that's in 4.2 is that what you're saying correct sure. yes ma'am yeah so i'm glad you caught them <laughs> in in one way or another because it wouldn't be appropriate for us even in our consent to have that on there so those two are removed did you have other concerns member klein um, on item one not on item one. Member Earl. So we have to approve the WebSCO, uh, the EBSCO contract. And if so, I'm not prepared to speak to that or to um, engage in that dialogue at this point. And I would ask that it be put on to the next, um, next month. I have so concerns with EBSCO and um, would like to make sure we're following E-rate and some other issues well, associated we, with it. That, yeah, it's not on our agenda, so it's going to have to get moved. So it'll have to be on next month for that, right? Okay, I'm just checking to make sure we're... So okay. It's, Thank you. Zach, we're going to have a problem with that, so we're going to have to let the vendor know. Yeah, I, I will let them know that we're moving that to the next month. Okay. Anything else on the actionable piece of contracts. Yeah, I don't have a, I don't have a motion. Vice Chair Belknap. Uh, so Chair, I'd make a motion that we approve um, number one off the consent calendar, but it's minusing the um, 039 and 060. There's Oh, because there's point of order. Yeah. Yeah. Okay. So I I I move that we can you we approve um, item number one on the consent calendar. My, point minus. of order. Yes. And there's Do, nothing there. But it, that's review, right? It's not actually. We don't have to approve those. Is that They're accurate? All review in number one. Did I understand that correctly? Is that correct? There's not one. One more time. There's nothing in number one. In anything. Okay, so, so Chair, if I may, very confusing. The, yes. the the backups are flipped. The agenda items aren't flipped. The backups are flipped. Uh, okay. So, okay. So we're not going to take. So we, don't have on one. we have nothing on one because no. of how we posted it. So we that's. Right. So, so the ones that are the backups to item number one are all the ones for review, right? Which and should have been put in number two. Okay. So there's no okay. action on one. The, no. The, what, what should have happened is the one, the EBSCO contract in, is the backup to item number two, should be in the backups to item number one for your approval. But what I heard Board Member Earl say is that you want to wait until next month. So. Because it's in item number two. For review. Yeah, so 
Right. Okay. Yep. So because of how we notice, because it's flip, there's nothing to review because it's that item is not noted for right. a public meeting as an actionable item. Yes, sir. So it'll come back yep. next month. Yes, sir. So there's yep. no action on number one. Right. Okay. Yes, yes sir. Thank, Thank you, sir. Thank you. Um, Member Klein on number three. Okay, so this is the STEM, um, and I, I have some issues with that. Um, first off, I noticed on page eight of the STEM school designation process scoring. Um, sorry, that's the rubric, even so though the who rubric. from staff is going to speak to it, and we'll have them come up? Okay, so on, on the rubric where no, they show no, the different no. scores for how these schools become STEM schools, um, I have a question on 5A under teaching. Uh, it says code of behavior and values. Um, I, I'm really curious, who's, what is this code of behavior and values and what behaviors and whose values is it referring to? Certainly. So I'm Kelly Yates from the STEM Action Center. This is a program that I oversee, and I work with the STEM team here, headed by Nate Ock, um, to support that. So what we are looking for in that particular rubric item is that they, as a school community, have identified an appropriate a code of behavior that is appropriate for their community and their values, and those are shared with parents and students. So expectations. Um, regarding behavior and things like that are clear to everyone in the school community itself. We don't evaluate the values themselves because that's to be done by the local community, but we do ensure that it is um, shared with students, parents, teachers, and anyone else that interacts with that school. Okay. Uh, yeah, I'm, I'm curious, is there somewhere to see what those individual schools have done as far as that goes? Certainly. And, those are provided in their portfolios, and I could share those if you would like. Okay. And, and how do they go about getting parent feedback on that? So that, again, is up to the school's process. Um, typically, what we expect to see is involvement with their PTA or PTO, community council, um, their district superintendent, um, and other parent involvement um, arenas as appropriate again for that school okay um, so so the way I get the answer is it's it's designed or designated by the LEA yes and what parent group that that's how I understood that's it correct. was operating okay thank you that's just for my own mind mm -hmm. here <laughs> member Klein okay um you know, there's, there's other things on the rubric that are of a concern um, as far as what's required um, for, you know, the, this stress on, on the social, emotional um, learning that's um, incorporated in, into it um, and several other things. Um, I want to go to the other document. Um, I think it's the last one in, yep, the last one in that packet. Uh, where it um, goes through how it's scored, how they receive their score for each different area, uh, what they're looking at. And if you go to page 10 on that, let me just get there here. It, it requires, oh. oh, where did it go? It's not page 10. Oh, I lost it. Where is um, page eight? Sorry, it talks um, there on one F on standards and core core sequence. It says the the school takes standards, Utah core standards, twenty first century skills, etc., into account in in school scheduling, curriculum yeah. design, and instruction. So you know that last column says you know if they're exemplary in this, they get three points. Well, I looked up the. Uh, p21.org website that it lists there and they've got their whole page on our um, on, it goes it takes you to, to battelleforkids.org um, to their 
DEI commitment page, um, their, our diversity, equity, and inclusion commitment. Um, and so I, my concern is that uh, these schools are being rated uh, to be STEM schools, not by um, necessarily their skill or ability in science, technology, um, engineering, and math, but in social um, justice type of, um, it's a social justice rubric that they're being scored on instead. Yeah, you want to respond to the question or concern? Yeah, as I was hearing that, um, we didn't previously have language of portrait of a graduate. That language, so the focus on the 21st century skills um, and, those, and its related components will actually be switched to portrait of a graduate for next year to make that more clear. We aren't looking to external organizations. We're looking to um, research-based and research-identified uh, components of effective instruction across the board. So when it gets to that three-point column, um, what we're really hoping to see is the four content areas associated with STEM integrated into other content areas, just as we know literacy is integrated across the board. Um, STEM and its cultural components, that problem solving, critical thinking, creativity, we want all of those things to be integrated across the board. And I think changing that language to portrait of a graduate makes that more clear. Um, we don't direct people to Battelle, they are an organization that um, designates school in Ohio and Tennessee, but in the past it has been a resource when we didn't have one locally. So we will be updating that language. Okay, um, can I have a follow-up? Yeah. And then 21st we'll century um, learning or 21st century skills, that is in our portrait of a graduate in our strategic plan, that language is in there, correct? It's 21st century. Um, because everything that I've studied on that tells me it's a euphemism for uh, the very things that we're trying to keep out. So, okay. Thank you. That's all I have on that one. Um, do you want me to go to the next one? Um, let me see if there's somebody has a comment okay. with what was previously stated. A couple lights come on, then I'll come back to you, Member Klein. Member Norton? Yes, in that section one right there, you. Um, I wanted to get back to... Um, the, the behavioral conduct, the behavioral code. Um, and without going into that information, I am assuming it's some of those same kind of words that we were just talking about from Portrait of a Graduate, that the school um, you know, is looking for respect and responsibility. Am I on the right track there? Exactly. Okay, yes. so, so that's what we're, we're speaking about there, as well as um, with this, this, the curriculum and the collaboration, again, that it is, it is going cross-curricular and, you know, that all-important problem solving. That, yes. Am I right? Yes, you're okay. right. Okay, I'm, I'm feeling good about it. Thank you. You're Thank welcome. you, Chair. Thank you for that clarity. Member Klein? Okay, so just going on to, to the next one. Yes, We're please. good? Okay, uh, so it's the, um, oh, where is it? So the preschool IDEA grant. Um, so uh, my first question is, uh, it says in it that it went out for... Hold on, is that? No, hang on. Sorry. You're going to yeah, five? five is okay, set. hang on one second. Okay. Is there any, do you have any, is there any other questions on on three? Member Hansen? No, motion to approve uh -huh. three on the consent calendar. Second. Motion and a second. Want to speak to your motion? No. Okay, discussion to the motion, Member Cannon. Yeah, just just a, a quick question. I noted that each of these schools there, and there are five of them. So I am. At, we only have five STEM schools in the state. Is that correct, or, or is, is this just a, co a cohort or something? This is a cohort, so okay. a designation lasts for five years. Okay. Four of these five are redesignating. Okay. One school is. Um, designating for the first time this year. So then how many STEM schools do we have across this, the state? These are all elementary schools. Could mm -hmm. you uh, let us know a little bit how many elementaries, how many junior highs, how many yeah, high schools? Yeah, of course. So prior to COVID, we were at 61 STEM schools, um, schools that had intended to reapply during COVID have 
significantly backed off of that, um, understandably. So we are now at, um, with if I include these five, we'll be sitting at 41. So 41 STEM schools across the state. Um, of those, the vast majority are elementary, which is interesting because the research that was initially used to create the STEM school designation process was based on secondary schools. Um, so of those 41, I would, I don't have my data right in front of me, we're at 34 to 35 elementary. The remaining six are secondary. Most of them are charter schools. Do you have so, a follow-up, Member Cannon? No, but thank you for letting me ask the question. Okay, Member Lear. Uh, two questions. I, I missed the number of total STEM, STEM schools that you just... There will be 41. 41. I'm so sorry. And okay. then secondly, whatever happened to the acronym STEAM? Did I lose... Did that somehow change again in my... And I missed it? <laughs> Um, so I'm from the STEM Action Center, so we call it the STEM school designation. We, of course, include and advocate for inclusion of the arts as well. It's an excellent entry point for people, especially who don't identify as STEM people, for lack of a better term. Okay. Um, most of our schools consider themselves STEAM schools, especially at the elementary age. Um, and then as we get into those higher ones uh, where they want to say we, we focus on more of the technical aspects, um, then they uh, stick with the STEM school phrasing. Okay. Um, but yeah, we, of course, love the arts, encourage the arts. Um, we're just called the STEM Action Center, so that's what the program it's was called. It's still the, the official name is STEM. Yes. Okay. Thank you. I just didn't want to miss that transition. Yeah. Thank you. I'm not seeing any other discussion. So the motion before the board is to approve of the general consent calendar item three, the 2022 Utah STEM school designation approval. All those in favor, say aye. 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 Those aye. opposed? No. I said aye. And we've got the one aye. Uh, motion passes. Um, <laughs> Member Klein on number five. Sorry, I was a no on that last one. What's Just that? I yeah, was a no that. on that last one, just to make yeah. sure. Okay. Uh, so I'm looking at, so number five is is the preschool, or the, sorry, the IDEA grant. Um, and I had some concerns on, on the rubric numbers 22 and 24, um, where it's, you know, we're determining things by disaggregating by race and ethnicity again. Um, instead of other, other conditions that are more appropriate, um, especially for special ed students. I don't know why race and ethnicity are necessarily part of that. Um, so, so let's take one at a, one at a time. That's all we have a, um, Assistant Superintendent Voorhees here. So we'll... Thank you, Chair. Leah Voorhees, Assistant Superintendent of Student Support. Um, thank you for the question, Board Member Klein. So this uh, application is uh, obviously created by the Department of Education, by the Office of Special Education Programs, and the, the Code of Federal Regulations requires several things related to uh, looking at students with disabilities and the eligibility criteria for a student determined eligible based on the 13 disability categories and whether or not a state disproportionately determines or and then an LEA. So this is related to the state, but then we do the same type of analysis for each LEA. Uh, whether a state disproportionately determines uh, that students are eligible for special education in any one or more than one of those 13 disability categories. So if a student is, if, if more students statistically are determined eligible in the category of specific learning disability than the rest of the nation, or if more students in one school district were determined eligible under that category, than were determined eligible in our state, then that statistically can demonstrate 
that the policies, procedures, and practices for determining a student eligible for special education may need some work because there is a disproportionate determination of eligibility. So that's one of the, the criteria and one of the analyses that we have to do. The secondary analysis is related to your question, which is then within each of those 13 disability categories, we have to do a disproportionate representation analysis to determine if there are more students determined eligible for special education in any of the seven federal uh, race and ethnicity <laughs> categories. So it's a 42, um, 42 category analysis that states and territories have to do every year so that we are, are not over identifying students with disabilities and so that we are not under identifying students with disabilities. And so in this, in this application, we are assuring the federal government that we do that analysis, that we run those analyses. And that's required analysis and we do it every year. And I reported that information for last year's analysis to you in the March board meeting when I brought um, the APR, our annual performance report results to you. Um, that's indicators nine and 10 on our annual performance report. That's where we report that information um, to the Office of Special Education Programs. And Utah did not have any um, LEAs that had significant disproportionality last year. Does that help answer the question? You have a follow up on that particular item? Um, no, thank you. I appreciate the explanation. Um, just one other question on this item that I had was uh, it says that it went out for public comment, that they didn't receive any public comment. Um, I was unaware that it went out for public comment. I wonder how many others here knew that it went out for public comment, let alone the public. So um, is there something we can do to fix that so that it's we are as a board aware when something goes out for public comment um, so that we can alert our constituents if the if if um, staff isn't going to do that we can do that so that we can get public input on these things um, otherwise it kind of defeats the point of having putting it out for public comment if nobody knows it's there can can we can you speak to how it goes out or yeah so um, we uh, we prepare the documents, we post the documents, and then we share with our partners that the documents have been posted. Um, we are our, our major partners, the Utah Parent Center, the Disability Law Center, LEAs, of course, the PTA, um, we, as other state agencies, um, we, we have a and a group of uh, disability community partners, the Legislative Coalition for People with Disabilities. So we share that information with them. Um, I actually uh, sit down with many of these partners and talk through it, um, but we do post it and share the posted link with all of those partners um, for their, um, their comment, their information. But we're happy to do something differently. Thank you for answering my mm -hmm. question. You, had, you have additional questions? Yeah. Vice Chair Davis. Yeah, I just met a parent yesterday who said they came and met with you and thanks for spending so much time with parents helping them through um, understanding these issues. Um, how many years has this requirement been in place, the eligibility requirements? Uh, so since 2004, um, the IDEA was reauthorized in 2004. The regulations um, were authorized shortly thereafter, have been updated a little. Um, so this particular requirement, if I remember correctly, and I can check, but this is 2007. Okay. The disproportionality analysis requirements were updated again uh, Four, 
It's been in the time that I have been assistant superintendent, so I'm guessing it's four years ago, and we revised our calculation, um, and many states and territories revised their calculation based on that regulation update. It was just a piece of the update, and I, I believe it was four years ago. So roughly 20 years with mm -hmm. updates. Thank yes. you. Mm -hmm. I'm not seeing any other uh, member booth. I would just like to um, <clears throat> bless the name of Leo Voorhees <laughs> for, for 20 years of, uh, and when I think of what you have to go through, um, I'm amazed and uh, I don't know how you keep doing it. Thank you. Thank you. I love doing this for you. I love being your representative, so thank okay. you. Um, Vice Chair Bell now. Yeah, I'd like to make a motion that we approve number five on the consent calendar. Second. Second. Want to speak to your motion? No. Discussion to the motion? Okay, none. The motion before the board is that the board approve uh, item five, <coughs> Individuals with Disabilities Education Act, uh, annual funding application, federal fiscal year, uh, 2022 of the general consent calendar. All those in favor say aye. Aye. Those opposed? Aye. Those opposed? Okay, motion passes unanimously. Thank you.